Hi everybody and welcome to Church Online again today. We are continuing with our Chosen series. We've been watching along with the TV show and I have to come with confession today. I have to come in repentance before you today and say that Helen and I have watched ahead. We couldn't resist. We have flicked on and we have gone ahead. We're nearly finished the whole series because it's so good. If you haven't had a chance yet to join in with us all watching that together, uh, you can do that still. We'd love to have you on board. It's been such a powerful time. Last few weeks have been brilliant in church. We've seen uh, multiple people uh, come to know Jesus as Lord and Saviour. We had a great time in our biggest ever drive through last Sunday. So uh, God is on the move. Keep praying, keep leaning in and keep believing for what he is doing in and through us in this season. And last week we had a great message from Jade. If you missed it, again, catch up with that. Jade spoke about the dress code for the chosen out of Colossians chapter 3. Some things that we got to take off and some other things that we've got to put on. It was such a challenging message, so challenged me in this season that we're living in. And Jade finished off um, by touching on a parable that Jesus told, the parable of the wedding feast. Um, and, and at the end of it, Jesus says this uh, line that's quite famous and is quoted quite a lot. And it says that many are called, but few are chosen. And it maybe makes us ask this question, well, well who, who is called? Who's chosen? Am I chosen? Are you chosen? So today, I want to dive into this. I want to look a little more about it. And I want to talk to you today about called, chosen, and the bit in between. Called, chosen, and the bit in between. Let's pray together before we go any further. Heavenly Father, I pray that today your word would be a light to our path and a lamp unto our feet. And I pray just that you would uh, take everything that I would say and you would filter it through uh, your heart and your uh, desire, Lord, for your people today and what you would have them hear through me. So Lord, I just pray that you would speak to us all in these moments that we gather around your word. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. We're going to read this parable together. It's found in Matthew 22. It'll be on the screen, but I encourage you, if you've got your Bible there handy with you, grab it and let's read this along together. Matthew chapter 22. It says, Jesus also told them other parables. He said, the kingdom of heaven can be illustrated by the story of a king who prepared a great wedding feast for his son. When the banquet was ready, he sent his servants to notify those who were invited, but they all refused to come. So he sent other servants to tell them, the feast has been prepared, the bulls are fattened, the cattle have been killed, everything is ready, come to the banquet. But the guests he had invited ignored them and went their own way, one to his farm, another to his business. Others seized his messengers and insulted them and killed them. The king was furious and he sent out his army to destroy the murderers and burn uh, their town. And he said to his servants, the wedding feast is ready and the guests I invited aren't worthy of the honour. Now go out to the street corners and invite everyone you see. So the servants brought in everyone they could find, good and bad alike. And the banquet hall was filled with guests. But when the king came in to meet the guests, he noticed a man who wasn't wearing the proper clothes for a wedding. Friend, he asked, how is it that you're here without wedding clothes? But the man had no reply. The king said to his aides, bind his hands and feet and throw him into outer darkness, where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. For many are called but few are chosen. This passage reminds me of that story about uh, the old preacher, uh, the late Ian Paisley, and he was preaching on this one night and he was saying, there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. And there was a wee old lady on the, the back row and she sort of stuck up her hand timidly and said, what if you don't have any teeth? Teeth will be provided. In this story, the king sent out his servants to all types of people, the good and the bad, the rich and the poor, the popular and the unpopular. See, the invitation didn't depend on who or where the person was or what their past looked like. 
You see, it doesn't matter where your story starts. It doesn't matter where you are when you receive the invitation. It doesn't matter where you are when you hear Jesus calling. No matter where you are today, no matter how lonely or low or broken you're feeling, no matter what your past looks like, no matter what your present looks like, the invitation is the same. In this parable, all of these people were called. He sent them out and said, everyone that you see, invite them to this wedding. Everybody was invited to this wedding feast. You know, Second Peter says, the Lord is not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. It doesn't say the Lord is not willing that the, the nice people don't perish. God, it doesn't say that the Lord is not willing that the good living people shouldn't perish or that the Lord is not willing that those who go to church every Sunday should not but no he says the Lord is not willing that any should perish everyone is invited everyone is called to the wedding feast but not everybody is chosen the thing that determines whether or not we are chosen is our response to the invitation no one is excluded except those who exclude themselves. See, in this parable that Jesus told, there was three kinds of people who disqualified themselves from being chosen. There were those that just plain refused to come. Nope, not interested. Don't want to go. Not interested. There were those that maybe wanted to come, liked the idea of it, but they were too distracted and caught up in other things. One, farming, business, all sorts of stuff. They liked the idea of the wedding feast, liked the idea of heaven, liked the idea of the kingdom of God, but they were too busy with other things. Or maybe they were enjoying some other things too much to consider coming to the wedding. And then there's those that came. There was this one guy, in fact, that came, that tried to come to the wedding but in his own way, on his own terms. He tried to show up just any old way that he pleased. He tried to come without wearing clothes on. He was dressed in the rags of his own efforts instead of the robe of righteousness and forgiveness that Jesus has on offer. Come on, stop trying to be good enough for Jesus. Stop trying to be good enough to get into heaven. You see, what qualified the called to be chosen was their response to the call. What qualified the call to be chosen was their response to the call. There is a response required to the invitation. There's a process to go through. There's a process between being called and being chosen. There's some decisions to take. There's some actions to take. And today I want to explore that process a little bit. But get this. This is not just a message for people who don't know Jesus yet. This is for all of us. There is a daily invitation from Jesus. To take up our cross and follow him. To move from called to chosen. There's a guy in the Old Testament, fairly famous, wrote one of the largest books called Isaiah. And in chapter 6 of Isaiah, he goes through this process. He goes through the process of moving from called to chosen. And he experiences four stages in this process. Revelation, realization, restoration, and relocation. Isaiah experiences a revelation, a realization, a restoration, and a relocation. And we're going to study this together. So again, if you've got your Bible, get it open to Isaiah chapter 6. It will be on the screen, but it's great to have it in front of you. 
if you can. And we're, we're just going to read a bit and stop and read a bit and stop and go through it. Isaiah chapter 6 says this. In the year that King Uzziah died, there was an interruption to the normal. Uzziah had been king for over 50 years. He was one of the most productive, one of the most successful, and one of the most godly kings that Judah had. He wasn't perfect. He made a lot of mistakes. He kind of didn't finish very well. But for the most of his 50 years, Uzziah brought stability and he brought prosperity. But Isaiah finds himself here in an insecure situation. Things are being shaken. Everything that Isaiah had grown up with and grown up into, everything that he had been used to was changing. Maybe something in your life has died. And I'm not talking about a person necessarily. I'm talking about something, a dream, a situation, something in your life. Maybe you've been left disappointed and confused and worried. But Isaiah was confronted with the process of moving from called to chosen in the year when things were uncertain. When the familiar and the comfortable and the safe was gone. It's in these moments that we find out who really is our king. Is it Jesus? Is Jesus our king? Or is it our job and financial security? Is Jesus our king or is it our health? Is Jesus our king or is it our pride and our position? And Unfortunately, sometimes God has to take away some kings in our lives in order to get our attention. You see, God's priority is not our comfort or our happiness. God's priority is our journey from called to chosen. Hear me, I'm not saying God doesn't want to bless you with good stuff. Because he does. But that's not his primary concern. See, what God is passionate about is about moving us on the journey from called to chosen. That is his purpose for me. That is his purpose for you to move us to a place where we are kingdom building ambassadors of heaven here on earth. There is a process from called to chosen. In the year that King Uzziah died, Isaiah says, I saw the Lord sitting on a throne high and lifted up and the train of his robe filled the temple. Above it stood seraphim, each one had six wings, with two he covered his face, with two he covered his feet and with two he flew. And one cried to another and said, holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is filled full of his glory. And the posts of the door were shaken by the voice of him who cried out. And the house was filled with smoke. In the year of uncertainty, in the year of chaos, in the year where some of Isaiah's kings died, he had a revelation of who God really is. He saw the awesome, powerful creator and sustainer of this universe who flung galaxies and stars and planets into place and who designed the very fine detail of the most complex thing in the universe, your brain. And he saw that he was holy, holy, holy. See, when we see God for who he really is, we don't just see his power and his might and his majesty and his splendor and his holiness, but when we see him, at his very core, at his very essence, we see that God is love. The very center of his being is love. And the revelation that we need to have in this moment is that the powerful, holy God of this universe loves you. 
Maybe some of us need to revisit that revelation today. The king of the universe loves me. I dare you, wherever you are today, say that out loud with me. The king of the universe loves me. In the midst of the uncertainty that Isaiah was in, at the start of his journey, along this process of called to chosen, Isaiah got a revelation. He saw heaven's perspective. But then, verse 5, So I said, Woe is me, for I am undone, because I am a man of unclean lips, and I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips. For my eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. Isaiah has a realization. You see, when we see the Lord for who he really is, it forces us to see ourselves for who we really are. Isaiah wasn't happy with what he saw. Can I tell you, there's plenty of things that I see in me that I do not like. How about you? It was only when Isaiah saw just how holy and how awesome that God is that he realized how unholy he was himself. You see, when we have that revelation, when we see him high and lifted up, when we see him in all his holiness and splendor, it forces us to confront the reality of our own sinfulness and brokenness. The revelation leads to a realization. When we realize that we aren't all that our Instagram feed says that we are, when we realize that we aren't the person that our dog thinks we are. It always wags the tail. The realization that we don't measure up. And there's no possible way for us to do so on our own. See, this is not God wanting to heap condemnation on us. To kick us when we're down and rub it in our faces of just how dirty and unworthy we are. It's him leading us to a place where we come to the realization that we are absolutely nothing without the miracle of grace. See, the Apostle Paul teaches us that even the law, even God's design, God's rules, weren't designed to condemn us but to lead us to the place of salvation, to lead us to a place of our acute awareness of our need of Jesus as our saviour. And what I love in this story is that God does not leave Isaiah floundering in this place of realization. Immediately, verse six, then one of the seraphim flew to me, having in his hand a live coal, which he had taken with the tongs from the altar. And he touched my mouth with it and said, behold, this has touched your lips. Your iniquity is taken away and your sin is purged. Isaiah had a revelation of the greatness of God which forced him to realize the extent of his own sinfulness and brokenness, but immediately God brings him to the place of restoration. See, God's grand plan from even before the moment Adam and Eve fell was a plan of restoration. A plan to to make a bridge, to make a way between the gap of a holy God and a sinful people. And his name is Jesus. And Jesus the holy became Jesus the sinful so that Jason the sinful could become Jason the holy. 
Put your name in there. Say this with me. Out loud. Wherever you are. Jesus the holy became Jesus the sinful. So that the sinful could become the holy. Paul puts it this way in 2 Corinthians. He said, For he made him who knew no sin to be sin for us, that we might become the righteousness of God in him. See, Jesus didn't just take our sin. He became it. He became your breed. He became your lust. He became your pride. He became adultery. He became murder. He became deception. He became shame. So that the place of restoration is available for you today. And it doesn't matter your past. It doesn't matter your present. It doesn't matter your failures. It doesn't matter your questions. It doesn't matter where your story starts. The invitation to the wedding feast is here. And there's a new set of clothes for you to wear. But the thing that determines whether or not we are chosen is our response to God's invitation. If you'd like help to respond to his invitation today, please ask us. If you're watching as we broadcast, we have a pastoral team online right now. If you're watching some other time, there's loads of ways that you can get in contact with us. We would love to help you. But you know, this story doesn't end there. This is not the end of the process. Verse 8. And I also heard the voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send? And who will go for us? Then I said, here I am, send me. See, Isaiah had a revelation of the greatness of God. He had a realization of his own sinfulness and brokenness. He had a restoration experience. But then he found himself at the place of relocation. See, once we've seen God for who he really is and confronted the reality of who we really are, experienced the beautiful grace of restoration, then we've got to be in the place to say, here I am, send me. But unfortunately, so many of us camp at the place of restoration. But moving from called to chosen is a process and it ends at the place of relocation. In the episode of The Chosen that we'll watch this week, or I sneakily watched a couple of weeks ago, we'll see some of the disciples drop everything to follow Jesus. Everything that was familiar, Everything that was comfortable. Everything that their life had been built on and that they loved. Because they were called and they wanted to be chosen. And I finish today with this challenge. And it is a challenge. Have you had a relocation experience? Or are you camped at the restoration? This is not necessarily, Lord, send me to Africa or China or somewhere. No. This is, Lord, I've seen your splendor. I've seen your holiness. I've seen the reality of my own brokenness, but I have so experienced your, restor your restoration, your grace, your mercy. 
So here I am. Send me. Lord, send me to my school. Here I am, Lord, send me to my workplace. Here I am, Lord, send me to my neighbor. Here I am, Lord, send me to my family. See, how do we know today if we're chosen or if we've just been called? We know when we've had a revelation, when we've had a realization, when we've had a restoration, and when we've had a relocation. I want to finish with these words of James, the half-brother of Jesus. And he says this in James chapter 2. What good is it, dear brothers and sisters, if you say you have faith, but don't show it by your actions? Can that kind of faith save anyone? Suppose you see a brother or sister who has no food or clothing and you say, goodbye, have a good day, stay warm, eat well. But then you don't give that person any food or clothing. What, what good does that do? So you see, faith by itself isn't enough unless it produces good deeds. It is dead and useless. Now, someone may argue, some people have faith, others have good deeds. But I say, how can you show me your faith if you don't have good deeds? I will show you my faith by my good deeds. Here I am, Lord. Send me. Let's pray. Lord, we come to you today um, aware and in awe of your majesty and your greatness. Lord, I pray that you would refresh that revelation for us today, Lord. Not just of your majesty and your power and your holiness, but of your love for each of us. Lord, we realize as we stand before you, a holy God, that we are so uh, sinful, that we are so broken in and of ourselves. But Lord, I thank you that you lead us to that place of restoration. Lord, will you set our feet upon a rock? Lord, will we exchange our ashes for your beauty? But Lord, I pray that we would not stop there. Lord, I pray that we wouldn't camp around that God, but that we would move to that place today of saying, here I am, Lord. Send me. And Lord, we give you permission today to use us in whatever way you see fit for your kingdom and for your glory to see lives won and changed and transformed and set free for your glory and in the power of your gospel and in the name of Jesus we pray these things. Amen. Amen. Thanks for joining us today.